Well, hello, that's me again. Today is July 24th, 2024. It is Wednesday. It is a hump day. So congratulations on that to those who work, you know, nine to five. And um, let's start with a little bit of news, so to speak. And uh, we will start with, um, well, the noise, there is a lot of noise, and again, as I state non-stop, and I stress this fact constantly, practical policy or practical politics are non-existent in the West. It is primarily about words, all kinds of euphemisms, you know, all kinds of BS, and this is the only thing they are capable of doing. This is in the public sphere, which is, of course, talking, you know, as I already stated many times, uh, they love to use this hyperbole, you know, in um, Western media, like, he smashed him, or he absolutely destroyed, and the things of this nature, you know, so when they describe just basic, you know, verbal, you know, bickering between the two losers who are probably some legislator, legislators, either from U.S. Congress or from Parliament in Great Britain, or Bundestag, so, and it's all about words, there is no practice practical politics and the no practical policy because they cannot do that. And now when we have the situation with the special military operation continuing to absolutely destroy, devastate what's left of the armed forces of Ukraine, we suddenly have Mr. Zelensky uh, offering the peace talks. Mr. Kuleba, the foreign minister of Ukraine, also went to, you know, China. He met his counterpart, Mr. Wang Yi, and he also said that Ukraine is ready for negotiate. Well, it's noise. Obviously, Ukraine is not ready to negotiate. I mean, not so much Ukraine as much as its so-called political elite and illegitimate Mr. Zelensky and obviously Verkhovna Rada, which will be, become illegitimate on August 1st this year. So the response from Russia was a pretty standard, you know, so, and we have been through this before. So, uh, Maria Zaharova, the spokesperson of the Russian Foreign Ministry, responds to Zelensky talks proposal. And she is talking about absolutely the, the facts which we all know. The Ukrainian leader is capable of lying and may simply be trying to promote his peace formula, Foreign uh, Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zaharova has said. In recent weeks, Zelensky has said that Kyiv wants to end the conflict as soon as possible, preferably by the end of this year. He has also insisted on holding a second peace summit to achieve that goal. Well, it's, uh, you know, the, the uh, ending the conflict as soon as possible is basically the qu quoting of Mr. Trump, with whom, uh, as Mr. Trump said, you know, I had fantastic discussion. Well, Trump always had some kind of fantastic discussions, and nothing comes out of it except for the, you know, exacerbation of the present situation. And make no mistake, I'm really happy that this DEI hire, the chief of the Secret Service, has resigned. She should have been actually fired, together with a bunch of, uh, as Russians say now openly, they say, you know what, it's um, women's, um, you know, corpor corporation basically all around in the United States. And we have the result of the, obviously, uh, you know, this Miss, Mrs. Cheeto, uh, who, yes, she, uh, you know, basically admitted that it's the worst operational failure in the history. Sure, but you have been the boss of that. So there you go. You have to, you know, bear responsibility for this. So, and obviously, when Maria Zaharova also reacts to all these, you know, large words, we have also Mr. Piskov, who responded today, actually, very clearly, that, well, there is one problem with those negotiations, he said. Uh, Mr. Zelensky is illegitimate. So is, again, as I already stated, Verkhovna Rada, which uh, will become illegitimate on August 1. So, who are you going to be talking to? It is all about, obviously, United States and uh, uh, American uh, pre-election dynamics, and that's what is happening. It is all words. They worth absolutely nothing, uh, and they are worthless absolutely from the Washington. No matter who is in the White House, be that Mr. Biden, uh, be that Kamala Harris, uh, or, you know, obviously Mr. Trump, once he becomes president, where uh, many people hope so. So, and in this particular case, to discuss what? as Mr. Putin is on the record, the same as Mr. Lavrov, and everybody who is anybody in Russian government, they say it very openly. The 
main objectives of the special military operation, whose two of them are denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine, will be achieved no matter what. And until they're achieved, I mean, yeah, we can talk. But, of course, as you understand, the uh, Western media, they need to constantly, you know, portray Russia as just, you know, willing to negotiate. However, the situation is this. Uh, there is a rather shocking uh, poll in uh, Ukraine. It was conducted not by Russians or anybody. They cannot do that. Uh, what they talk about here is the Kiev International Institute of Sociology. And here what they say, cemeteries are overcrowded, and this gives people the idea of ending the fighting. With these words, political scientists comment on the extremely indicative results of the latest opinion polls conducted in Ukraine. Citizens of the country, as it turns out, are increasingly ready to abandon the military struggle and to uh, one degree or another support three uh, options for peace agreement with Russia. And uh, basically the uh, uh, one third of the, you know, polled people, they said that they are ready to abandon parts of, of the Ukrainian territory uh, for, uh, you know, the peace settlement. 32% they said. Well, there is one problem, of course. They do not understand that this is not about territories. This is, territory is a kind of like, you know, uh, how to put it, uh, it's a bonus if you wish, although it's not really a bonus to have any kind of Ukrainian territory. And so if you listened yesterday to uh, Garland Nixon's and Scott Ritter's and my discussion yesterday on uh, Garland's uh, channel, uh, Scott uh, Ritter made a very good observation, which is absolutely relevant to what is stated here, is that uh, all this, you know, talk about brotherly nations and, you know, Russians viewing Ukrainians as brothers, it's all gone. It's uh, Russians uh, switched their opinion and switched their, so to speak, uh, 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 mental tuning about Ukraine a long time ago. It's, yeah, more than a year. They don't view Ukrainians as brothers anymore. And actually, there's no, you know, if they kill more, so so be it, because obviously uh, the, there is a whole, uh, uh, how to say it, understanding on part even Ukrainians, Mr. Aristovich, Mr. Aristovich, look uh, him up, he was a big shot, you know, in the government at some point of time, he's sleazebag, he's war criminal, but even he comes out and speaks and he tells uh, uh, such very obvious thing. Ukrainians, he changed his tune, obviously, because he understands where the wind blows. But he says, Ukrainians, how are you going to live after that, after it's all over? Yeah, Russians don't want Ukrainians. They don't want them in their country. They don't want to have anything to do with them. And whatever uh, is happening to them, yeah, hey, they deserve that. That's the uh, mental state of Russia and majority of Russian population today. And um, if you take a look at the latest data on the uh, uh, what is happening on front, on the front, we can see ourselves that uh, they okay, then yet another brigade, and actually 67th Motor Rifle Brigade, all of its command have been annihilated. Russians found out where their uh, command post was, and Mr. Uh, Kinjal and Mr. Iskander visited there. And as a result, the whole command core of the brigade is wiped out, uh, apart from other people who have been present. But as you can see yourself, for yesterday, we have uh, 2,040 uh, uh, killed and wounded in uh, Ukraine, so we have 9 tanks, 36 armored vehicles, artillery and mortars, 70, so, and you can see yourself that more than, uh, well, it's actually 151 UAVs have been shut down, and one of the MLRS was also destroyed, so the slaughter continues, and for, uh, not for the first time, Russians were uh, just like nonchalant about it, yeah, let's continue this until Basically, there's nobody there to fight us. Then this is the reality of the politics. And this is the war crime and crime against humanity committed by the combined West, headed by the United States, which now wants to abandon and crawl out of this project, declare the victory, and drop everything on shoulders of Europeans who are brainwashed. And so in this particular case, what can I say? Uh, just to demonstrate to you that what is happening and how the uh, whole um, dynamics of this uh, uh, in uh, United States actually uh, is happening, if you wish, or unfolding. We have Wall Street Journal. 
And she says that Wall Street Journal allegedly, again, Wall Street Journal is tabloid. It's pretty much any mainstream U.S. media. It's tabloid. It's all kinds of the. They should concentrate on writing on the about the lingerie of you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Clooney or anybody else. But uh, uh, their politics is funny. But they talk now about that Kamala Harris is unlikely to keep the current crop of national security officials should she win the U.S. presidential election in November. According to sources quoted by Wall Street Journal, okay, let's imagine. I doubt it because obviously most of the polls which are presented where she trails Trump or she equals Trump in uh, you know polling numbers is complete BS and it's propaganda because this is the only thing that they can do in uh, American media. But however, here it is. Key Biden appointees, including National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, won't likely be extended in their current roles if uh, she somehow wins the elections. Well, I, I, whatever. We obviously understand that these are people which have been listed, and of course they're, you know, utterly demented and lost in reality. Mr. Biden, they were the ones who actually pressed on with what Trump actually started by destroying Russian-American relations under the pressure from the, uh, both uh, Ukrainian lobby and Democrats and APAC. So there you go. And now we have the situation that, well, Kamala Harris may not even hire or keep those people who are actually responsible for this slaughter at all. Oh, so yeah, if uh, even she probably understands that, yeah, you don't want these people around. It's not to say that she is very bright or smart, for example, as even oil price actually sta uh, starts the states. Pardon me. That uh, Harris will be very, very bad for uh, big oil. And uh, I can tell you uh, one thing. I might be, you know, um, supporting some environmental causes. I definitely don't like, for example, the, uh, you know, pollution and things of this nature. And I'm all for environmental controls for uh, all kinds of the uh, uh, productive uh, activity, uh, industrial activity and extraction. But and so they talk about that Harris has a history of prosecuting oil companies for environmental crimes and supports climate initiatives like the Green New Deal and the fracking ban. Well, here it is. This is the new uh, green, uh, green New Deal and fracking ban. Uh, yeah, that's the end of America. Okay, let me explain it very simple. And uh, so the same happened to Europe. And I don't think so Europe is coming back from that. So in so she sa uh, they say that in the case of a democratic presidency, with Harris in the White House, the federal government will be going after big oil. Will they be? Very well could be. These are fanatical ideologues. They have no scientific or engineering backgrounds. The only thing they know is how to go and, you know, uh, try to realize their, well, insane dreams, basically, you know. So, because, as I already stated, as much as GOP is a complete, I mean, sellouts and losers and people who will uh, betray America no matter what, well, a bunch of them I actually have loyalties to Israel rather than to United States and America people but DNC and Democratic Party it is a catastrophe for the United States it is a catastrophe for the world and actually what you see the so-called liberal you know international uh, in Europe these guys killed Europe not that I'm crying about it, make no mistake. I'm Russian, I know that, for example, majority of population, not all, make no mistake, I do not want to repeat this, constantly elaborate on this, not all, but majority of Europeans and majority European of European elites, they view Russians as subhumans. And that's why you have the situation constantly, which is unfolding in you, which you have to scratch your head. And believe me, many people say, oh, we're not like this. I know there are many Europeans who are not like this, but majority is. And here we have this situation. So EU moves to freeze Russian assets indefinitely. It's Financial Times uh, uh, tells uh, you. It's, as you can see, so it is today, and the EU is mulling a plan to freeze Russian assets indefinitely to allay U.S. concerns about whether a 50 billion loan to Ukraine would be repaid. The Financial Times reported on Wednesday, citing international docu internal documents, pardon me. 
So yeah, it's they there's thieves, they're scumbags, we know that. So and uh, Russians know that they as I already stated, like with the uh, with Ukrainians, uh, Russians don't look at the Europeans uh, other than their enemies. Uh, again, there are many Europeans who are moved to are moving to Russia right now, normal people with the Christian backgrounds, they want to grow uh, you know, their children in the normal uh, circumstances. They are accepted with the open arms. But for the most part, Russians don't care about Europe. If it goes, you know, to hell you, tomorrow, nobody will in, in, even flinch, you know. So it's, it's just the way it is. The th you know, the situation's changed. The situation changed so much that, as I already stated, I never experienced anything like this. And believe me, I went through the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, but if that hasn't been enough, and um, when I say that uh, they are in, uh, incompetent, and especially when I talk about, for example, not that people, please do not misunderstand me, that I decided to give Britain special attention. It's just that United Kingdom constantly is in the news. And when I look at them and I say that uh, British military is a joke, all their think tanks are a joke. British uh, general staff is a joke. I mean, those people do not understand warfare. And when you look at their backgrounds like this, and what can I say? So we have now Guardian. Guardian is very, very active for some reason. And um, we have Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker, uh, who is uh, army chief. Uh, for you to know, Mr. Walker has a background in agriculture. He graduated agricultural college and he received the liberal master of arts of something. So this is the guy who runs the military, okay? Uh, and, and he said, Britain must be prepared to fight a war in three years. Time, uh, time and double the lethality of its army as the separate threats of Russia, China, Iran and North Korea come to a head. The new chief of the army has won. Well, when you graduate, uh, the uh, uh, agricultural college, and then you go into the uh, one year long vocational school of the general staff course in uh, Great Britain. This is what you get. You get these people. So he comes out and he, well, I know they don't teach mathematics in the United Kingdom. They don't teach anything there anymore. But look at this. And so he talks about Russia. And all the Russia was embroiled in the war in Ukraine and on current trends, its forces would, Walker said, take five years to grind their way through the capturing the eastern Donbass at a cost of 1.5 million casualties. The country's history had shown it could bounce back. So, yeah, this is the nincompoop who has no idea what even basic calculations are speaking. And, yeah, the, when you look at this, yeah... Uh, British military, as I already stated, especially its army, it's a joke, okay? So he commands now what? One brigade. So, however, in his earlier remarks to reporters, the army chief argued Russia could emerge from its current war with a sense of wanting retribution for the support that was given to Ukraine and could pose a greater medium term threat than anticipated. Well, yeah, Russians are not, will not emerge. They are emerging with the sense of not just retributions, they do not want to soil their hands with dealing with Europeans. That's very simple as that. I don't think so. Russians will necessarily want to blow up, you know, MI6 headquarters or Downing Street 10. But I mean, you know what? They can and the UK will do nothing about it because they don't have any kind of the serious air defense uh, forces to even, you know, uh, how to put it politely, they will not last, okay, the whole uh, army uh, of uh, uh, United Kingdom will not last for a couple of days, you know, so, but, hey, there you are. However, we, if the, that hasn't been enough with Guardian, we have suddenly they, you know, go out and interview Mr. Sirsky. Mr. Sirsky is, of, of course, you know, the chief, you know, of the supreme commander or whatever the hell, you know, the, they fight, uh, Ukrainian armed forces, while well, Russians fight special military operation, it's not even war, but, and so they, they talk to this guy, the guy is a loser, complete loser, he is, uh, his family literally, I understand their horror to seeing their son, who is a graduate of the famous, you know, the uh, Kremlin uh, high, higher, you know, the officer school in Moscow, that I know we will win, 
and how Ukraine stopped uh, uh, general on turning the tables against Russia. So it's basically, I don't know what they smoke there. Well, the Guardian is a sewer, basically, and pe most people who work there, are uh, they are not normal people. as pretty much uh, uh, true for most of the media people. They are not normal people. But here he talks to, to this guy, and guess what? So this guy obviously goes out and begins to elaborate, you know, on that how he fights and how Russians are just dying and then he says yeah what about them I mean skepticism about Ukraine prospect of achieving outright <laughs> <laughs> Sirsky noted various positive developments. F-16 would strengthen Ukraine air defenses. They would allow Kyiv to work more effectively against Russian cruise missiles and to hit ground targets accurately. However, uh, okay, yeah, sure, so he be begins to contradict himself. There were limits to what F-16 might achieve, he stressed. They had to remain 40 kilometers or more from the front line because of the risk Moscow would shoot them down. Oh, there is no risk. They will be shot down and not only 40 plus kilometers away, probably even 200 kilometers away. But then again, Sirsky probably never heard about R-37. And uh, again, th this is the whole story, which is uh, so funny. And Russia had a superior aviation and very strong air defenses. Because of this, Ukraine was increasingly turning to unmanned aerial vehicles. Of course they do. That's the only thing which is left for them. But again, do not forget, Russia even unproduces uh, combined West several fold in unmanned aerial vehicles. So what they do, they buy those FPV drones and try to fly. Yeah, they can kill uh, one or two guys. They really do that. But you know what? It is one thing when you kill one or two guys, but Russians, as you already saw yourself, uh, just uh, yesterday alone, how many, I don't remember, 158 or whatever, uh, those drones have been shut down. So yeah, yeah electronic warfare works fine. And uh, then, of course, as I already stated, uh, the Br British are very active, you know, in presenting themselves as clowns, which they are in terms of warfare. And yeah, just uh, remove the goddamn this, the, their history, you know, the, in war. I mean, since World War II, it's, as I already stated, it's not a serious uh, ground force. Even the, when they had this the uh, Army of the Rain, you know, British Army of the Rain, which was part of the NATO force, which allegedly could resist Russians for about 30 days before they break through into the Western Germany and even in the lower countries. But hey, you know what? Let people dream about those things. You know, the um, problem, of course, with Pink Floyd and Roger Waters' wonderful li lyrics is that a quiet desperation is the English way. It's not. They're bellicose, they spew BS all over the place, and their uh, general staff level people, I mean, they're laughing stock. No, I mean that Russians laugh at them. These are in income poops. They are not even real professionals. So, and just to, uh, you know, what after this whole, you know, noise from British media, we have this situation. So there you go, suddenly, yesterday, UK military problems much worse than thought, Defense Secretary. Okay, yeah, so we have the Liberist government, we have this imbecile Starmer who, yeah, he would probably soil his pants when being in, near any kind of serious uh, caliber guns, but the British Army, Royal Navy and Royal Air Force are all struggling with hollowed out forces, procurement waste, low morale. British Defense Secretary John Healy has warned. And he talks about that we now also see that these problems are much worse than we thought. Well, I knew it, that they are much worse than he thought. It, 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 you know what, you have to hire, prof hire professionals who can tell you this. But there are no professionals there, except for, you know, the terrorism, they are really good at that. You know, just to blow up some, uh, you know, civilian objects and things of this nature. That's British way. So he added the Defense Secretary, who has been in office for just over two weeks as part of the new Labour government. Healy also said he wants to establish a new year for UK defense in the face of rapidly increasing global threats. Well, um, how to put it politely? Uh, scientific, uh, scientifically wise, uh, United Kingdom is not even contender in the first 20. Uh, in the first top 20 countries anymore. It cannot build normal, uh, uh, forget about, I mean, anything normal. And uh, the only, you know, remaining um, 
skills which they had in terms of the their navy we all know how the royal navy faring and yeah they're good uh, nuclear submarines well you know that they cannot put out to sea even astute class submarines the uh, vanguard class strategic missile submarines are going on the patrol scaring either two maximum four trident missiles out of required 16. So, as you can see yourself, we have the situation where, they, yeah, as Mr. McGregor says, it's a Lilliputian force. It is. And not only Lilliputian in terms of size, its combat capabilities are near zero. Nil. That is why they wanted to, to you know, they you remember this, you know, uh, people who just, you know, waving hands and saying how the Challenger will run over Russians, those conscripts. Well, guess what? They demand the Challengers to be withdrawn from the, obviously, front lines. You know why? We all know why. Because there is no tank in the world which can sustain the Krasnopol hit on its, you know, uh, top armor or, you know, against the good old Carnet. And Challenger started to burn the same as the Abrams are burning. And Russians uh, recently, you know, blew up again a couple or three more uh, of the uh, Leopards. So, I mean, yeah, the whole uh, mythology of Western arms industry from United States to Germany, it's all crap. I mean, it was designed to sell to, you know, some kind of uh, people who would want to fight, you know, the third-rate countries, third-rate militaries maybe there they would probably fare better but I mean they are not real weapons for the actual 21st century uh, battlefield simple as that and that brings us to other thing um, French uh, we know that uh, just recently there was a visit of Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Iskander to one of the actually people say there are two uh, uh, positions or localities where the NATO officers held their, uh, you know, their conversations, planning. So, and near Kharkov in Zirgachi, well, there were more than 50 of them. You know, there are Americans, British, and even uh, French officers there. So, Mr. Iskander visited them, and Russian Defense Ministry confirmed that they killed senior officers of NATO. So, I mean, that will continue. Russians will continue to hunt them down. But because uh, we talk about France and basically the uh, Olympic Games, for example, Russians refuse to pay money for this crappy event anymore, totally corrupt, and who won't even to watch this garbage anymore? So, and uh, they didn't even buy the rights. Why? I mean, indeed, to watch what? And so, and they already, there are problems. We know there are problems with Paris. It stinks and it's dirty and there's crime all over the place. So what do they do? What French do? As all this as they you know they first put their women under the Wehrmacht soldiers and then they punish them you know very good you know they are really good at fighting that, that type of the threats right so well we have this situation so Le Monde Le Monde is a well it's neocon globalist newspaper it's garbage it's pretty much most of the French media are, well most media mainstream media in the world are and so guess what the French intelligence found the Russian spy suspected of having wanted to destabilize the Paris Olympic Games. And then the story unfolds. It is a wowzer. So, well, you understand that, uh, you know, they are retards in Le Monde. They are, they are morons, basically. So, but guess what? On May 8th in Turkey, K, some, the name of the guy, K, was to take a plane from Istanbul to Paris, where he lived, except that the Federal Security Service, FSB, agent, had drunk too much. Forbidden to board, he fell back on another flight, which left Bulgaria. On the way in a restaurant, the chef trained in Parisian school, caused his superiors of the Russian domestic intelligence services on the phone. So, well, so the guy from FSB, uh, so they get him, he lived in Paris, get this, now, I mean, this, uh, get the law, a lot of this. So, on July 21, K was arrested at his Paris home, the Paris prosecutor's office said. According to several European intelligence services, a map of an elite unit of the Russian special forces acting under the command of FSB was found at his home. Yes, also the, you know, it's a very good Russian tradition, especially FSB, that if you want to sabotage something, 
uh, and we'll talk about FSB just uh, give, give me a minute or so uh, they always go there with their ID maps of the special secret unions you know the, all those you know n- notes about how they will conduct the sabotage operation well there is a problem for this imbeciles who came up with this it's absolute garbage so uh, this story first FSB doesn't do these operations <laughs> Simple as that. FSB is a sort of equivalent of FBI in Russia. They do have counterintelligence. They do have all kinds of things of this nature, which are primarily domestic. And if somebody from Russia wants to sabotage, why? The French will screw it up anyway. So, and uh, want to, to sabotage Olympic Games <laughs> Uh, they should learn well but then again they are retards there in Le Monde uh, it's actually SVR and GU former GRU who are in the business of this FSB doesn't do those things but SVR the foreign intelligence service this is completely separate thing you know so uh, but again explaining this to the retards from Le Monde or any other French uh, media, it is like wasting the time because they are retards. And as you know, Dunning-Kruger effect, you cannot explain to a uh, retard that he's retard because he's retard. And so, you know, what can I say? So French will buy it. They will swallow it, you know, hook, line, and sinker because they are brainwashed, most of them anyway. So, and they lost their country, but so what's left? to create all those they pulled it out of their asses and this is not even laughable they don't understand even the basic things how russian government operates and how if they want to sabotage something it will it it will happen but again you know as i already stated west and professionalism uh, do not come together anymore so and this is what i wanted to tell you today uh, about this whole i mean cluster you know what it is cluster coitus okay so and uh, as always what can i say uh, those who like what i do please subscribe to my channel uh, those who can afford guys please support me on patreon or buy, buy me a coffee and two and that will be it for the hump day a little bit of the russian sit trap if you wish so and have a nice rest of the week and i'll talk to you later guys bye bye